I don't think incrementally anything has changed, you know, in my life uh, over the last three, four years. I mean, it it did change for a while, but then it kind of hit a plateau at some point, you know. Like, I think that plateau was like four or five years back, you know, where in terms of incrementally. Can I, can I ask you a question? What is that amount of money where that thing happens? <laughs> We'll keep it drill. Yeah, check. Yeah. And, sure. uh, and uh, we'll keep it fun. Uh, last time, I think you are the uh, few rare few occurrences of repeat on Cred Curious. Thank you for agreeing to come and chat. I think it's good to chat with you every two years as the world is changing so quickly. We spoke in October 2020, middle of pandemic. Uh, uh, my and, first my, uh, and my views have been quite wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm curious, uh, uh, how did the pandemic change you? Uh, you? You had a bunch of personal events also in life and uh, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, what is different in you now? What's different in me? Have priorities changed? Are you thinking life yeah, no, I mean, I'm, differently? I'm, I'm, yeah, the thing is, uh, so what happened was around the time the pandemic kicked in, uh, you know, my younger brother had a breakup, so we were kind of locked up, you know, and we had a lot of alcohol in us, you know, and, <laughs> <laughs> and that led to, uh, you know, like three months of, uh, I think, eight kilos of adding weight. And, uh, but then, you know, I think I kind of realized first time after a long time in my life that I've gotten old, right? Because the recovery wasn't happening, you know? I mean, I could do binging sessions before and kind of bounce back almost immediately. Uh, so, um, and then personally for me, I think, uh, you know, uh, Seema got diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and then there was a whole, uh, uh, you know, like the whole, you know, surgery followed by chemo, followed by radiation. And yeah, so that was, uh, like a, like a even more in your face saying, you know, what you need to care more about your health. Uh, Seema has always been, you know, really fitness freak, health conscious. So, you know, she could bounce back in like six months. Because I've seen, you know, like, you know, friends who have taken a long time to bounce back. So, so yeah, I think my priority in terms of health um, has definitely changed post-pandemic. I also, you know, I mean, I started consuming a lot of this content from, you know, guys like Andrew Huberman and Peter Atia, you know, people who talk about health. And this whole concept of backcasting, which is, you know, I'm, it is to say, like, how do you want to lead your last 10 years of your life? Um, and then kind of, you know, make changes today so you can lead. So because otherwise what happens, right, when we talk health, you know, we all have this, how do I want to look goals? And, and it's very easy to derail, right? As in, you know, and you slip up, you derail, you might take a while to come back up. But when you have a really long-term goal, you know, my goal is like 40 years from now, um, then even if you're slipping up, right, you, you know that it's a, it's a long-term goal. You know, you're not trying to get a six-pack or you know whatever. You know, so um, so I think I think that that has changed significantly in how what I eat, how I look about, think about fitness, how I think about my sleep, and all of that. So um, so yeah. So I mean, I think personally that has changed. Business, you know, I mean. It was it was times of stupidity. I don't know, you know why our business. Yeah, so let let's talk about stupidity for a bit. Uh, <laughs> almost everybody went a little crazy during COVID, uh, and people did different crazy things. But there was a very specific thing that happened in terms of people and money, uh, and that was reflected in crypto. That was reflected in your business. It was reflected in almost every form of some asset. Uh, people were just going little berserk and, and you saw highest amount of DMAT growth, all of that. What's your reflection? What really happened and what is the current state? Yeah, I think I think it was a culmination of a bunch of things. Uh, firstly, I think I think people have always thought about money and, and are like how to save better, how to generate more returns. But you know, there were a lot of people who were sitting on the fence. You know, like a lot of my friends, you know, I've been trading the markets till from seventeen, you know, like 
So there were people for the last 20, 25 years who kept saying, Nitin, I'll open an account, I'll open an account, you know what I mean? And I'll ask advice from you. And and suddenly, you know, like four months into COVID, and, and all these guys from you know, who kept saying from 25 years suddenly started opening accounts. Uh, you know, so people had a mind share, you know, so probably one, people st stopped spending as much, so there was more money on hand. Two was, you know, interest rates anyways had crashed, so, so there was always... Uh, like, how do I make more, mon more money from my whatever savings? Um, three was, I think, the, the most important aspect. was a lot of greed out there, right? As in, uh, you know, easy money, you know, th at least th this whole theory that you can somehow make money easily is, is really what attracts most people to any asset class, you know? And, and cyclically, every asset sees a bull market, a bear market, right? I mean, even, even real estate or gold or whatever, right? So, so yeah, this was the time for stocks, you know, so which is... Um, so there was, you know, money, the first bunch of guys who came, you know, opened money, opened accounts and invested in between March to uh, June, July of uh, 2020 saw money so quickly that, you know, they went around saying, you know what, dude, it's easy to make money in the markets. And, uh, and, and I think that, that ju just really uh, triggered the virality of sorts. And, you know, we've been right place, right time, bunch of times in this journey. Uh, but I think the biggest, you know, the most important time to have been at the right place, right time was, was the last one, two years. You know, right products, right initiatives, platforms ready to scale, and all of that. You know, so, so yeah, so there was a lot of luck on our side. I mean, of course, luck when I say luck, you know, I mean there was a lot of work that went through the years. But just being ready at the right time is is really what r luck is about, right? And um, so, so yeah, I think it was like a potent combination. Um, but from uh, last December. Uh, last December, Jan was really when you know markets peaked, right? As in, in terms of momentum, in terms of returns, in terms of activity, not just in India across the world. And uh, while India has you know outperformed most markets, I mean, you know, we are just four or five percent below you know, all-time highs. Whereas you know, like you pick up the U.S., you know, we are like 40, 50 percent below. So, so we have outperformed. Uh, so, so we're still okay. Uh, but in terms of the activity, it's it's dropped 30, 40 percent. You know, in terms of new user acquisition. I was just reading an article which said, you know, like, you know, like, you, I, I personally feel we almost hit a plateau in terms of the potential target audience out there. You know, people with money who can invest in the markets who don't already have an account. I'm like, you know, if the last two years didn't get them in, what will get them in? You know, I mean, like, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's unlikely that, you know, you suddenly have a large audience out there who didn't invest in the last two years who will suddenly decide to invest. And if they decide to invest, what is the event that will get them to invest? So. So in terms of my view, I think I think we were kind of you know, hitting plateau um, in terms of people who have the money who can invest who haven't already invested. Um, so so yeah, so I think I think uh, in the next one two three years will will probably be harder on the industry and, and there are a lot of like, regulatory changes as well. Uh, a lot of changes made in the last two three years have not impacted the business because the business has grown so much. But now that you have all these regulatory actions, plus the business slowing down, I think it's going to have a compounding kind of an effect on the business. Um, so yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm I'm generally like you know like what they call cheerful pessimist. You know, so uh, uh, so but yeah, but I remember you know back in October when he spoke, also I was you know saying a lot of pessimistic things. You know, so I was proved wrong uh, in in a lot of these things. But but I think it it helps to be better prepared if you are generally thinking about the worst case scenarios of sorts. Uh, Nitin, every time uh, we've met one-on-one, -on -one, uh, while the, I mean, for most people, this conversation should look like a very positive conversation, and, and most of us are, both of us are really pessimist and mostly uh, deeply existential in many things that we do, and I'm going to talk about the dark side of the 2,000 crores profit <laughs> for a bit. Uh, before we go to the dark side, let's talk about the bright side of it. Uh, can you give us some numbers, like how many customers, uh, most importantly, how many team members, how many engineers slash product people, uh, just curious, just throw out some numbers. Yeah, so um, I think I think for us, the business, you know, we've truly hit economies of scale. So when I said this, so in 2020, we were, uh, sorry, 2019, actually, uh, we were at a million customers, and we had 1,100 people on the team. Uh, we are 11 million customers with 1,100 people on the team. So we haven't added, you know, like no one. And and 
<laughs> Thanks. So the uh, the other thing, no, the, what I feel really proud about more than the profits, right? As in, because that can come and go, is really the trust we built uh, out there. Because today, these 11 million customers together hold almost two lakh crores plus securities with us. I don't think there's any platform in this country who's been able to build trust in such quick time. Of course, there's an ICSC, IHDFC, but they've taken like 30, 40 years to be able to build that. Right? So over the last 10, 10, 12 years, you know, we've been uh, the fact that people trust us with so much of security is really what I think is is the biggest achievement of the business. You know, I mean, if you build that much trust, money will happen. You know, I mean, you know, if not this year, we would have made money some other year, right? So, so the fact that we've been able to build the trust is really what I get excited about. Uh, about engineers, you know, uh, <laughs> we had we had a 35 member tech team, <laughs> so uh, you know, Kailash who heads a tech, you know, uh, we hired two people last year, and he said we hired too many, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, uh, when we started the business, I, uh, I also came from the school of thought that, you know, throwing people at problems solves problems. Um, but, you know, once Kailas joined in 2013 and just hanging around him, you know, his philosophies, you know, I mean, he's, he's like my spiritual business guru of sorts, you know, so uh, uh, his philosophy slowly kept rubbing on me. And then I kind of realized over time that, you know, he's actually right that, you know, people complicate problems. Uh, they don't really simplify, and uh, so yeah. So we've been very particular about hiring. Um, uh, I think COVID in that way was a blessing because um, when the when the business, you know, when the lockdown happened, suddenly the business was scaling. I think we were one of the few businesses which was scaling when lockdown happened, the first lockdown, and and there was no way to go quickly hire people. Um, so the first thing I did was, you know, I was saying, no, let's figure out what job is inefficient at Zerodha, and. Uh, so we had like a 500 member inbound sales team, right? Which is, uh, you know, people, you know, they drop off during onboarding. We call them up and say, dude, why do you drop off? You want to open an account, et cetera. So, you know, we took a 50 member team of inbound sales and we said, let's move them to support. Uh, and we saw it made no difference, right? I was like, damn, <laughs> you know, how is that possible, right? And then the business kept going. So one day, you know, I sent an email to everyone, did, you know, we're stopping inbound sales. And it made no difference to our sales. You know, it made no difference to our conversions. It made no difference to our leads. I was always bothered about this inbound sales team, you know, like giving targets and, you know, like giving, you know, in terms of conversions and, you know, like motivating talks. And I'm like, I, I don't even know what I was doing for 10 years, you know. So the thing was, what happened for the business was in 2016, until 2016, onboarding was physical, right? People had to send a physical account opening form. So unless you followed up with the customer a bunch of times, no one would do it. Right? But then onboarding became online in 2016. And, and post that, I think at some point of time, I should have realized that if someone doesn't want to open an account, he'll probably not open an account just because you're calling him. Right? As in, and, and we don't, you know, we have never induced greed and, and stuff like that to open an account. So there's never been a freebie. And, you know, I've never, you know, there's never been like, you know, I've never given a sales guy any upsell and, or anything. You know, we never sold anything to a customer till late. So, so yeah, so I mean, like that was like a big realization. Uh, now what happened was all of these 500 people moved to support. The support ratings went up significantly um, because one of the hits we had taken as a business from the uh, from before was really the quality of support. And now that we had like suddenly like a like a 700, 800 member support team, just the support, you know, the interaction times to everything else, you know, just just improved significantly, which I think also kind of fueled into more business, you know, because people then start saying, oh, dude. I call your call center in like a, under a minute. I'm talking to someone. You know, I send a ticket in like you know, in a ha less than half an hour. You know, like someone's responded to it. You know, so and yeah, and, and we went internally and tried to uh, find every single problem that can be automated. And, and we were forced to do it because of COVID. You know, if not for COVID, maybe you know we would try to you know do the inefficient thing, which is to go hire people and you know try to solve for that problem. Um, yeah. So now that we've done that. Now, every time you're hiring, like, you know, every single hire, you know, I'm like, you know, dude, what, do we really need this person, you know? So, uh, and, and, uh, and I think, you know, like a, a smaller team is much easier to manage as well. And I think the business is easier with smaller teams. Um, like, I, I don't know how I'll be able to, you know, if we were a 10,000 member team, I don't know how I'll manage 10,000 people, you know? So I think I have found a comfort zone in this, like a, 
you know, around 1,000 people on the team. So, uh, you know, because I, I almost know everyone's names now, you know, so, you know, if I, if, you know which, is, which, is, which is a cool thing, you know, to be as a person leading a business that, you know, you can actually talk to, you know, like, you know, every person in your team by, by their name, you know, so. Um, just to double click, uh, these are how many unique different businesses that are covered between these 1,100 people? You See, also have a little bit of that NBFC piece, like, right. is all of that included yeah. in that? So, I mean, okay, so COIN, which is our direct mutual fund platform, is run by one tech guy and three ops guys. And uh, we, we run like a 35,000 crore AUM on that. Um, and the NBFC is run by five people. Um, the, uh, and how large is that already? Uh, that's, I mean, that's we, the thing is, like you know my view on lending. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's a, <laughs> and my view on derivatives, but let's go to that part. <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about. It. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a hidden feature. We haven't spoken about it. I think it's a proc uh, like a hundred crore kind of a book. Okay. You know, so, um, and uh, what else do we do? Mm, yeah. Uh, the Rainmaster, you know, a fintech fund. Uh, you know, we are two timing it, so you know, it's like a bunch of us who run zero is also a part of uh, Rain Matter. Um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, no, as in, as in the thing is, one of the things I think I did right, you know, early on was to say that anything that's adjacency to our business, I'm not going to attempt building it. You know, I mean, uh, I'd rather collaborate versus try to do everything myself. So that's how Rain Matter started in 2016, and you know, all these startups. So, for example, you know, like Ditto, which is a, which is a uh, insurance business, you know, and we are partnered with them. It's already like probably the second largest online insurance distribution platform in the country. And uh, so, yeah, so we could have built it ourselves, but I would have probably lost focus on a core offering. So, so I said, you know what, let's, and that's how we've done, right, from small case to, you know, streak to, I don't know, like there are 15, 20 startups in that portfolio, you know, so... Uh, so that way we didn't have to, like, you know, we could just focus on that one core thing which uh, we, where we believe our competencies lie. And, you know, looking back, I think that has helped significantly as a business, you know, instead of, you know, kind of going between, you know, trying to attempt to build too many businesses of sorts. You know. uh, we'll, we'll double click on Rain Matter for a bit, but I want to answer one, uh, we'll get one qu answer is that uh, um, when you are uh, kind of driving so much efficiency with the fewer people, right, uh, and you're also investing in many fintechs where you may not see the same amount of efficiency that you drive in your own company. And now that you've invested in 15, 20 of them, what do you think they are getting wrong? And I'm asking this advice for cred as well. You're an investor in cred. Uh, and I also want you to answer the question that I've always asked you that most companies lose money on customer acquisition. You actually make money on customer acquisition. You have a negative CAC. Can you talk about both of these things? Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I am truly the believer that money is the cause, the root cause of all evil, you know, so... You know, so. <laughs> and, and the cause of your profit, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, too much money, let me, let me just put a hyphen there, you know. So, uh, no, I, I think, I think uh, you know, uh, in companies that we have invested as well, I think um, as soon as, as long as there was not, en like, too much money on the table, you know, just, you know, everyone thought about efficiency and, you know, making whatever's available work. But this whole last five, six years of, you know, funding bull market of sorts, I think has just, you know, kind of taken away the focus. Uh, I mean, it's a cycle, right? I mean, it'll come back again. You know, it'll be even in vogue soon. Um, but but I agree. I think, see, the, see, one of the reasons, you know, when people ask me why we didn't raise money as, as, as Zeroda is because I used to be, I used to manage portfolios before Zeroda and I, I hated managing portfolios. Right, this, you know, if, you know, just the obligation that money brings on the table. Right, so as Zeroda, you know, as we did well as a business, and you know, when people started offering money, you know, I, you know, in my head, I was like, dude, if I take this guy's money, and you know, I have to pick up his phone call, right? I mean, today I don't have to pick up anyone's phone call, right? As in, so, you know, and <laughs> so that that obligation, in a way, you know, was why we avoided. Uh, but then, because there was not so much money on the table, then you had to find ways to be efficient as a business. Uh, I think one thing, you know, that I understood about our industry very well, right from before zero, the, because, you know, I'd, I'd done this for a while, is, you know, at, at that 20 bucks a trade that we charge, uh, it's almost impossible to recover three, 4,000 rupees if you spend on a user. It just made no math, you know, it didn't, it just didn't add up, you know. So, 
So because it didn't add up, I thought, you know, it's, it's stupid to be spending 3,000, 4,000 rupees. And, uh, and I always knew that I, I don't want to be into, you know, we don't want to be doing, selling different products. Right? I mean, this was another like a core philosophy saying, you know, like I think as a businessman or anything in life, you know, your odds of doing well is higher if you kind of build around your core competencies and not try to go do too many things at the same time. Um, you know, so a lot of people think, you know, if you kind of spread your bets, your odds of hitting is higher, but you know, I, you know, it actually reduces. You know, so uh, so it's about just finding that one thing and just giving it all types. You know, so uh, so yeah, so it started like that. Uh, so which meant that, and also because there was no money on the table, you had to figure, you know, to be a little smart about it. So I still remember uh, when we first started Zero, the the two things I did. I I worked in the call center. I love telecalling. So you know, I got a database of. You know, this was a time. But telecalling was still okay types, you know, it was not really you know, like what it is today. So I, I think the first thousand customers, I must have spoken to all 900 of them, 9950 of them. I used to call myself Sachin and cold call them. And then, you know, when you're doing all of this, you figured what's the trigger points, what will get them, you know, to open accounts. The second thing I think we did was uh, get on some of these uh, online platforms where there were traders interacting. Uh, because I had like a back history on these platforms, I, I, I kind of, you know, like, a, you know, plugged in Zeroda, right? As in, um, and, and then I kind of realized this whole power of social in, in, in today's world uh, and word of mouth, et cetera. While we don't spend, um, like, you know, we spoke about this recently, which is, you know, we run a really popular affiliate program. So every customer of ours can refer, you know, their friends and family, and we, we share a certain percentage of the, refer of, the, of the brokerage. But we share it only once it's generated and nothing before. So technically, you know, you can look at what we eventually pay as CAC, but it's not really CAC because, you know, the customer, you know, I'm, I'm sharing of, of something that I'm already generating. So, you know, it's not really technically a CAC. So, so yeah, so it's, uh, uh, so, um, I mean, it started like that. And, and, you know, and then competition came in and they started you know, upping the game in terms of how much money they're spending. Um, then, you know, we were forced to up Every time you know someone was spending more, I was like, you know, dude, we need to do something better in terms of product, in terms of offering, in terms of initiatives, because otherwise, the guy who's going to spend more is going to win. So it almost, you know, competition spending almost forced us to, like, say, you know what, you need to constantly innovate as a product and, and, and a business for you to be able to do well. So I think at the end of the day, as a business, the idea is to build moats, right? As in, it's, you know, uh, what is hard for someone else to copy, and spending money isn't hard. You know, I mean, you know, so, um, so, so yeah. So I mean, like. I, you know, like in two thousand between 2000, uh, actually 2011 September is when, you know, Economic Times wrote a small little article about discount broking and mentions that other on it. You know, our business suddenly ticked up quite a bit. Uh, you know, but then, and then I started spending every day one hour with the press, right, you know, with the journalists, you know, between 2012 to 2017, 18. And then I kind of realized that by 17, 18, the power of the press was draining. And, um, and, and, and that's when I got on social media, because I was, I was actually a late to this whole social media party. You know, it, you know I used to manage zero those accounts, but I kind of realized that they were kind of killing the reach of the platform, like, you know, like a business's reach, because they wanted the business to advertise. Um, so that's when I, I, I opened that LinkedIn account, and you know, like I started talking stuff, you know? so, which was because then again, you, know, you kind of realized that now that we have a story which is unique to say, that itself is a mode, right? As in, just to be able to say things which most people are not, are not saying, you know, even though many might agree, uh, it, it gives me a lot of freedom to say it because I, I don't, you know, there's no obligation. So, so I'm like, you know what, I need to leverage on this because it will eventually also help the business grow of sorts. So, so yeah, so at every point of time, I think, you know, uh, you kind of try to say and do things which is very hard for the competition to do. And, and that has in turn also helped uh, Keep the you know CAC low. I mean, the joke here is you know when I, I you know like right when we started you know I some you know someone on the team asked me did why you know charge an account opening fees and I gave him an analogy of you know back in I don't know if Bangalore you know the clubs and pubs you know still have a cover charge but you know some of them probably do they do okay I mean I mean still <laughs> male centric the whole city right now so <laughs> right. they probably need to recover that. Yeah, so, uh, so, but back, you know, when I used to go, you know, clubbing and pubbing, whatever, you know, so back in, say, in early 2000s, et cetera, you know, so the coolest clubs and pubs in town were which had a cover charge, right? <laughs> I was like, you know, like, you know, th they were the ones who made the most money, they had the best crowd, you know, uh, everything, you know, I mean, the ones who let everyone enter for free, I just, 
or paid them to come. <laughs> paid them to come, you know, didn't really have anything. So I was like, you know, like uh, charging fees, you know, in a way also filters out the audience, you know, like from the serious to non-serious. The, in, in our in a regulated business, every customer brings a compliance burden, you know, compliance risk. So I'm like, you know, if I don't want to, I'm not going to make business out of him. Why even, you know, get him on, right? And and two is, um, our business is also, you know, about real money, right? It's not Zynga poker, right? As in, I mean, you know, so I mean, so I want, you know, I want that people to have like a like a seriousness of sorts, right? At the start, you know. Committing money, right, at account opening is a, is a way for us to say, you know what, was you're doing something serious in life, right? Uh, so you're coming in. I mean, I mean, this is how we had thought about, you know, like why charge an account opening fees, and that strategy has worked. You know, uh, I mean, if you leave away, take away last year's profits, but say profit from start of the business till say 2021, um, all the net profit we generated, if we had spent 4,000 rupees a customer to acquire, we would not have been a profitable business. Right. Uh, I mean, the net profit was equal to four thousand into all the customers still die. You know, so um, so yeah. So it's it's kind of the the, the strategy has actually kind of played out okay. You know, so. um, I'm gonna ask you uh, two questions. One is uh, uh, so I spoke to a bunch of financial influencers, and you run a lot of affiliate programs with them, and I asked them that you work with almost everybody and all of your competition, and who do you trust the most, and uh, like, hands down, one answer, zero, the, and on everything, the way you run it, the way you compensate, the way you have been consistent, uh, and and it's not that you, like, been doing this forever, like, you've also learned this while doing that, so what has managed to even create trust in these cohorts, number one, uh, and, and while the competition was doing everything that they are doing, and I'm not saying that they are not, they will make money also, like I'm assuming that there is enough room for that, but why do you think you actually did much better uh, despite all of this cash that came to compete with you? Yeah, I mean, some of these guys have actually made lots of money from a competition, you know, like, like stupid amounts of money, but they still give their serious business to us. Right, and and I think it's again got to do with trust. I mean, so uh, even for the partners, we have a forum where I actively interact with all our partners. Just to give an example, and we allow all partners to interact with each other. I don't think anyone does it, right? Because you don't want affiliates to be interacting to each other. No one's going to create a centralized platform because you're then afraid that some new guy will come with a new product and take away all of these affiliates. I mean, all of these partners. I'm like, you know, dude, you know, if these guys have to be spotted, they will be spotted, they will be taken away. I mean, you cannot not do it, you know, trying to protect, you know, trying to be like, you know, keeping your affiliates like a secret of sorts. Uh, so, and, and then, you know, just actively, you know, I think answering to these people, uh, being very consistent in our, you know, program. Uh, I mean, we have, flows, of course, tweaked it over time. I think, you know, we, I mean, the reason they like us is also because, you know, we have a stupid, you know, <laughs> you know for a late program in a way, in a sense that, you know, we pay for life. Uh, but, you know, but we didn't, we didn't go and change it, right? I mean, I think, I think where you break trust is suddenly, you know, you committed into a certain relationship saying something, and then you go back and say, you know what, I won't do this now. It's, we haven't done stuff like that. And, uh, uh, and then, you know, you keep doing that over a period of time, you know, that I think trust builds, right? I mean, you know, the customers, you know, and the reason I think 11 million people open account with us is because, you know, we have never done anything which is not right for the customer. And it's the same thing with the partners as well. Um, um, and, and I think it's, it's kind of helped because, you know, so we have like, like quite a crazy amount of partners, uh, you know, like having these guys by our side is, you know, in a digital world, um, you know, it, it helps the brand, you know. I mean, uh, you know, it's not like you know, it's just a one way up, right? I mean, we've had our roller coaster, you know, we've had our bad moments. Because there is trust, you know, a lot of these guys have supported through our bad times as well. So, uh, which also helps the brand in a way of sort. <laughs> uh, talking about trust, uh, one of the most unusual things that I have seen you do consistently is talk about how very few customers of yours are making money, and and how. Uh, some of the trading behavior is not good for their money, and and uh, you've openly talked about that. You've you've published stats about it, uh, and it sounds very counterintuitive because if they really stop doing that, it'll impact your revenue and profits. But you still talk about it openly. F 
first of all, what do you think is going on? And like, why are people not listening? And uh, why do you do it? So the thing is, you know, like, I think I, I'm not thinking of Zeroda as like a five year business or, you know, like, I think, I mean, I, I found my life calling. I'm going to be, you know, at 60, probably be doing this. Right. So I'm not looking at customers coming, generating quickly and then burning off. You know, I'm thinking, how do I keep my customers active for 60 years? I mean, un until I retire, whatever, right? No, like forever. Right. I mean, how do I get them to be active in the markets forever? And they can be active forever only if they're doing better with the money. I mean, otherwise, you know, you're going to come, you're going to do some stupidity, you're going to disappear. I mean, like the biggest reason for, uh, you know, the very shallow market participation in this country, while we have 9 crore DMAT, but if you actually go pick up how many people are actually tr actively traded last year, it might be 1 crore. I mean, what's the point of having 9 crore DMATs if only 1 crore people are actively trading? I mean, that 9 crore number is just, I mean, it's, I mean, it's of no use, right? Um, so, so one, I think, one, I think, uh, you know, like I'm constantly thinking, how do we get people to do better with the money? So, and, and while it might seem it's for some social reasons, but it's really actually also for business reasons, right? I mean, um, because for every business, the cost of acquisition is really the biggest challenge, you know, acquiring a new customer is the biggest cost. So if you have a customer, why do you want to lose him, right? As in like, you know, first is that. And two is, if you have a customer who's active, he's going to introduce a lot more customers to you. The only way people start trading, investing in the market is, is because of, you know, peer. I mean, no one randomly sees someone, you know, like an actor dancing around trees and say, you know what, dude, I'll open a trading account. I mean, you know, so, I mean, even if someone opens a trading account, he's not going to put money in trade, you know. So, um, so yeah, so it's very important that, you know, those customers remain active because then they're going to propagate, you know, they're going to, you know, kind of the word of mouth is going to really kick in. But if you stop trading, who's going to talk about markets? You know, that it stops, right? As in, you know, and the whole power of compounding is to be able to, you know, to kind of leverage you know, on, on, a, on a larger scale. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, I think, I think one of the problems I've had in the last two, three years of our growth has been that a lot of people have come to the market have come come with the wrong expectations, which is you know it's somehow easy to make money in the markets. The problem is you know, when someone comes with the wrong expectation, they get disappointed, and then you know they curse the markets itself, right? Because you know the, the markets are not right. I mean markets are not wrong. It's just that you know you came with the wrong expectations. So so that's why you know now that I have a wo have a voice and people, you know, kind of give some credibility to the voice because of the success of the business. I think it's it's my obligation to kind of go out and talk about this. Um, and I'd rather make 200 crores over 10 years than make 2,000 crores once and then not make, you know, uh, over time, you know. So it just has less of volatility in the business as well, that way. Okay, I'm going to get to more business stuff. Uh, I'm going to switch back to philosophical side. Uh, uh, what's your relationship with money now? Uh, how has it changed? Uh, and and through that, can you also talk about what you're doing with Rain Matter and all the other initiatives that you're doing? But how has your personal relationship with money changed? I mean, I, I started my life wanting to be a trader. I mean, not wanting to be, a, I started my life as a trader. So, you know, if you came to Nathan's room back when I was 17 years, um, it had like a house with a swimming pool, uh, you know, a supercar, <laughs> Uh, you know, like a bunch of fancy watches and... You got all of them, now what? No, no, I mean, but then I also had like, you know, I, I'm also very passionate about sports and fitness, etc. So I had like this, you know, I need to do a half Iron Man in this much time. I need to be able to do this much with the guitar. So I kind of, I, I think it's it's like, you know, as I, I've, you know, uh, you know, as the money has happened, I've realized that, you know, once you have the money, whatever money can buy, you can get it easily. And what money can't buy is really... I think it's really, really hard to get. Um, so I'm, I don't think incrementally anything has changed, you know, in my life uh, over the last three, four years. I mean, it, it did change for a while, but then it kind of hit a plateau at some point, you know, like, I think that plateau was like four or five years back, you know, where in terms of incrementally... Can I, can I ask you a question? What is that amount of money where that thing happens? <laughs> so there is, I, I don't know if you know this, you know, like there was this very interesting study in the US saying what is the optimal amount of wealth to have to lead a peaceful life? 
because you know if you have too much money you have just too many options you know it's like going to a restaurant with an unlimited menu like you know if you have you know and you have an option to eat any everything right i mean you're just confused it's 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 horrible so in the us the number was 50 million dollars right so apparently at 50 million dollars is where you know you can lead an optimal life you know you can you can lead a very comfortable you know you know you can go and do whatever but it's still not so stress free that you know you have to worry about you know like you know what governments going to do to you types you know so it's uh, uh, i think i think uh, <laughs> i don't want to throw the number <laughs> in india you no, should like, <laughs> you should you should okay uh, we should yeah. tell this folks uh, <laughs> okay no i mean i think i think uh, uh, accounting for purchasing power parity or sorts i think i think that number is probably like between 10 to 15 million dollars in india i think incrementally there is nothing much to do post that you know so you know once you have that much money i don't think i mean unless of course you know you have these ambitions to go buy a jet and stuff like that right i mean uh, you know and then which you, you know if you don't have what do you do you know incrementally with more money right as in um, i mean i was for a while for example had had taken fancy for watches because then as a as, as a guy starting my life i thought you know like you know this watch which is really expensive is so cool but then you know once i started using apple watch i'm like dude what is wrong why are people wearing <laughs> you know <laughs> this now you know this watches which has no utility you know it's more like jewelry you know so so yeah so i i, I like you know i've been wearing an apple watch for like 4 5 years so now it's like that you know so you, uh so you start questioning you know uh, uh these things so um, but yeah but but uh, so yeah so the question now is that um you know as you make more money i think there is also uh a responsibility of sorts to kind of use it for the right reasons um uh, because like personally at, at, at zeroda i think the core team we all believe in this i think one of the big problems with the planet is really the concentration of wealth and and uh, and i i can see that problem only increase and not decrease because i've realized it's so much more easier to make money today than what it was for me 10 15 years back right and it must be for you and it must be for you know everyone who's you know seen some wealth in life right because just money makes more money compounded so which means money is going to keep going away from the masses and keep coming you know funneling up to to the top so so and i think you know it's it's kind of you know the owners on the people where the concentration is to kind of use it for a you know better good of the society etc so and that's how rain matter happened you know i mean rain matter you know the the fintech happened in 2016 the idea that we want to collaborate uh, but you know uh, in 2020 when we actually started you know after meeting all of these you know whatever i thought in my head was rupee numbers uh is is where <laughs> uh you know is when uh, uh you know we were like did we need to do something about this and and the business didn't need more money right doesn't we are not spending money as a business um uh, and i have no ambitions to become like this financial conglomerate i mean like people ask me do you want to become icic or hdfc or next hd i'm like no dude i'm like you know like i just you know i'm kind of enjoying my life doing this so um uh so yeah so it's uh so that's how you know me kalash nikhil you know uh, we we kept talking about this and you know we formalized and we started the foundation and uh, you know we we allocated like 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 100 million dollars to begin with and uh, uh, we're kind of doing two things there one is um, partnering um, all non profits who are kind of working in the field of climate change creation of livelihood a lot of thing today you know might not seem climate change but they're all intersecting with each other you know so um so like one of the things i i kind of really like as an idea today is to be able to create like a, there are 60000 clusters of villages in india each cluster having 30 villages is you know is, is can we make each of these clusters like self sustainable of sorts um, um uh, because you know the problem with each cluster is like if you go into a village today what you'll realize is uh, everyone in a village is really consuming uh products from the cities right so what it means is whatever little money that is getting generated in the village is kind of going away from the village right and and so the question is how do you make it sustainable so the money kind of remains there because the wealth remains there then only the the cluster or the village will do well so so yeah so i mean we've been thinking about the i mean these are really large problems right i mean i don't think you know i mean i'm not saying that we're going to solve for any of this but just just attempting to you know kind of take on this problem is very exciting and uh, yeah so that's it's really you know and, and then we're also supporting for profits which are kind of working in the same space because a lot of times you know financial incentives also can kind of can solve for some problems in life you know so. 
Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions that I have from the team. Uh, and there are all sorts of variety over here. Uh, so there's a question from Govind which says, uh, uh, how to be more right than wrong? Mm, that's, yeah, wait, that's quite interesting. Okay, how to be more... I think, I think um, um, like, like I said earlier, right, I think building, doing stuff around your core competencies, you tend to build like a gut, like an instinct towards it over a period of time. And, uh, and, and, and really, I think that's the only way to be probably more right than wrong, which is you know, just build core competency around whatever you're doing and keep doing it for long periods of time. Uh, eventually, you know, if you love what you do and you're building core competencies, your instincts tend to be more right than wrong. And if I, if I look at even the Zerodas journey, uh, a lot of things that we did with this whole you know, like made a plan and said, you know what, let's do a survey and let's figure this shit out like that. No, I mean, hardly ever worked. Most things that have worked for the business are these instinctive ones. Right? I was sitting together and said, dude, do we go zero brokerage? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, let's go. You know? So, I mean, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, I mean, and, and I, I kind of look back in time and I realized that uh, the reason, you know, a lot of these things worked was because those instincts were built over, you know, like a long period of time. And, uh, yeah. So and um, and and takes time. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, you know, especially with the youngsters today, you know, everyone wants to go from point A to B very quickly. Um, you know, you can't, unfortunately. You know, so it, it takes time to build these core competencies and instincts. Um, there's a question from Gayatri over here. It says, uh, "With uh, you have diverse sources of data, and what is the framework Zeroda uses to bubble up the right, meaningful insights for every user? Like, is there a framework tenets that you use?" I mean. Again, you'd be surprised. We don't have a data team at Zero then, so we don't look at customer data. You know, I mean, like it, you know, when I say this, it's just you know, people like you know, but uh, yeah, I was like, you know, we for a, for a brief while, somewhere in between, we thought we're gonna sit and analyze and figure stuff out, but incrementally, we, we it was not worth the effort. And in our business, you know, like I, the question we asked was, you know, would I like if my data was being looked at actively? And you know, we all said no. We will not like it. So we're like, then, dude, if you don't like it, then you know, how can you do it to your customers? So and uh, so yeah. So we uh, we never really pursued on having a data team. Um, and and we've done okay. I mean, see, the thing is, businesses can be built different ways, right? As in, uh, so uh, one of the reasons I talk about this is because you know, just to say that, oh, it can also be built this way, you know, which is you don't have to like sit down and analyze every data, find a trigger point, like today. Like, you know, I think we spoke about this last year. As in, in last year, we've sent 11 push notifications on a mobile app, right? And every one of that we have debated. We said, do, do we really have to send this notification, right? Because, um, because, like I said, you know, I think the building business is about building modes. It's about doing stuff which is hard for others to do. And it's very hard for my competition today not to be sending push notifications, right? And so it's very easy for us to be like you know, be able to stand out. You know, um, you know, just to be, just to take this position that I won't send you a push notification, I won't send you an email, I won't spam call you, I won't spam SMS you. Um, you know, it just helps us stand out as a business, and it's actually a very easy way of standing out the business versus trying to go spend like hundreds of crores or rupees. You know, so uh, if you have to, I'm, 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 I have a question from Dheeraj, but I'm going to modify it a little bit to kind of cover a wider range. If you have to give two, three, or four points to fintechs on how to create trust, what would you tell them to do? So, see, the thing is, it's, it's you know, <laughs> while I might say it, it might be very hard for uh, someone to follow it, uh, especially because, you know, once you have taken on this obligation of someone else's money, there is a pressure to grow at a certain speed, right? And, and it's very hard to do some of the things that I might say, right? As in, just, it's just because, you know, you have an obligation to your investor first to be able to grow quickly because, you know, that's how, that's why he's given you the money, you know. So, um, I, I, like I said, you know, the easiest way to build trust is to continuously keep doing what is right for the customer, right? I mean, say what is right. I mean, like a lot of people say, but then you have to walk the talk types, you know, in the sense. Um, like, like, like I said earlier, you know, even, even at derivatives, for example, at Zerosa, right? You know, if you're onboarding onto derivatives, we actively say, dude, it's high-risk product. Are you sure you want to do this, et cetera, right? I mean, 
uh, even for example, you know, it was very tempting. I mean, if I, if I was bothered about revenue and profits, it was very tempting for us to do margin funding. Margin funding is essentially a guy is trying to buy 100 rupees worth of stocks. I'm telling him to buy 200 rupees, I'll lend you for 100 rupees. It's a no-brainer. You know, I think we would add 1,000 crores of revenue overnight if I did this. But we haven't done it because I know it's not the right product. Because most people who come to the market shouldn't be borrowing money to trade stocks. Right? And, and we shouldn't be the enabler to be, you know, for these people to do this. You know? so, uh, so, yeah, so I mean, I think, I think it's just you know, being able to do these kind of uh, decisions and, uh, and keep doing it continuously over a period of time. Like, like, I, like, I think the last five, six years, right, has kind of given an illusion that you can build a business in four, five years. It's impossible to build a business in four, five years. You know, I mean, there's a question I ask almost every scientist that I meet who's working, you know, on, on, on carbon, et cetera, you know, saying, is there a way to grow a forest really quickly? And he says, you know, you can, you, you can take a tree, you can put, you know, like a lot of steroids to it, you know, growth hormones, et cetera, and a tree will grow fast, but... Creating a forest is different. Creating a forest is the intersection of so many things, you know. So, uh, uh, which, which unfortunately, I mean, for, unfortunately, needs time, you know. So the business is also like that, you know. I mean, um, so yeah, I think I think I think people should think of building a business as like a ten-year project, and not like a two-three-year project. And and then when you think what is it's a ten-year project, then your decision-making framework is what is right for ten years. Let me do that, versus what is right for the next quarter, next half year, next. 12 months because today I think one of one of the things I've seen with most founders is that they're always in constant pressure to meet a certain target which is six months away one year away and and it's very you know it's very hard to optimize or you know kind of prioritize what is right for 10 years when you have a pressure to perform for the next six months or 12 months right so so I think I think what founders can do well is you know when raising money just tell them dude I'm not going to grow at this speed you are interested you know invest you invest otherwise you know you know, I'll probably find a way to, I mean, I don't know if I can say that, I'll probably find a way to grow without raising money. But, but I'm saying, I think, I think you need to get investors on the cap table who, who don't pressure you to grow really fast. And if you, if you can do that well, I think, you know, you'll have more freedom to be able to do what is right for the customer uh, continuously of sorts. It's funny, uh, I've been uh, running venture funded companies for now over 13 years. And it's funny, I've never really been told by investors to grow faster. Uh, it's actually quite interesting on what the world believes uh, it to be. Uh, it's usually your need to kind of get to a certain scale faster. And, and the reason you're taking capital and burning equity is that you are saying that, okay, the cost, the, the trade-off is faster growth, right? And you're putting that fuel to accelerate that. Uh, and it's funny, I've also run a profitable business for 10 years in my life uh, where I know exactly what you mean by every single cost, every single item, every single trip. Why do you need to travel? Why do we need to fly? Like all of these things are questioned. Uh, the, the, the point is that I think, uh, like you said, but the end outcome of a building an enduring business will take time. Yes. You can get the first, it's like a marathon where you can run the first five kilometers fast or slow, but it will still require the same, I mean, ultimately the, the big business will still look the same. There is no fast acceleration really that can take there. That's a good point. Uh, I, I'm, on that note, uh, there's an interesting question from Jenny. Like, what are the two, three decisions? Uh, you, you've talked about what worked out for Zeroza. There are multiple decisions that have worked out for Zeroza, including the charging the cover charge to many other things that you've talked about multiple times. But what are the two, three decisions that did not work out well? Like, where you felt massive conviction, but did not work out well? No, see, I think one of the things that we have done well has been we have experimented. I mean, we have launched so many products, killed so many products, so many initiatives, and killed so many initiatives. So, uh, but I think, like, so where we've been smart about is that we have attempted to do it. You know, so when we have had an idea, we've said, you know what, it, if it's worth attempting, we should go do it. But I think where we've been smart about it is saying, when it's gone wrong, we've just killed it very quickly. Because, you know, there's never been that whole ego at play with saying, you know, whose head is on the table because this product didn't work, right? As in, because I think a lot of times this product end up, you know, bad products end up being kept open for too long because someone's responsible for that, right? Uh, so, so having like, um, you know, like the, the way we've internally organized the business, you know, having no one's head being response, you know, is being on the table when something goes wrong uh, in terms of any new initiatives or anything new that we have pursued, 
uh, has meant that you know I can't really pick up three top bad decisions. I mean, I mean, I think we've done maybe 20, 25 bad decisions in terms of thinking of an idea and product which you thought will work. You know, like I, for example, we started an initiative called Open Trade. Uh, so we thought, you know, like there are a lot of our traders, customers who make money, but the problem they have is they have between 50,000 to 1 lakh rupees, right? So they don't, you know, even if they make, say, 5% a month consistently, you know, on 1 lakh rupees, you're making 5,000 rupees. You cannot survive your, you know, with 5,000 rupees, right? So, so what the you know, good trader does is he's trying to make more, which is he's trying to make 20% a month, but in the process, doesn't even make the 5,000 rupees now. So the question we asked was, if this guy can make 5% consistently, can't we build him an audience which will pay, pay, say, 100 rupees a month and see what he's doing so they can replicate? Now, if this guy can get 1,000 people paying 100 rupees a month, he can make a lakh rupees now he's talented. I mean, seems like a no-brainer of an idea, right? As in, you know, you know so, so we started this, you know, we spent some time around this, you know, called open trade. Um, but a bunch of things went wrong. <laughs> the first thing was, uh, so what we did was we kind of realized that a lot of people have performance pressure. You know, you put them on a stage, you know, people you know, tend to choke. Uh, so uh, so we, we knew for, uh, up front that, you know, there'll be performance pressure. So we said, let's not allow these guys to be there with their real names. So we, we gave them, you know, uh, stars, names of stars, you know, whatever, Alpha Sirius and et cetera, you know. So, um, but the problem what these guys did was they went around social media saying, you know what, I am this star on open trade. And I mean, their performance just dropped off the cliff. You know, like, uh, you know, people who are good traders just turned out to be bad traders, you know, I mean, because of the pressure they had now, you know, because they had like all this following on social media saying, oh, you lost money, you know, dude, what are you doing and stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah, so I mean, and we killed it, you know, so, uh, so like that, I mean, we've, we've attempted a bunch of things and, um, um, uh, you know, and uh, we've, uh, we've been, I think, like I said earlier, you know, we've just, we've been, what the right thing we've done is killed it and not tried to pursue it for too long. Uh, there's a question from Shobit over here. Uh, how do you expect PMS to evolve in India versus, let's say, trading? And uh, there's another question which says that while Warren Buffet has advocated for index funds, do you expect PMS to expand a significant pie of the market? Like, how do you see that evolving? Yeah, I mean, PMS is in, for those who know, don't know, it's portfolio management services. I mean, uh, the, the thing in India is that to be able to use a PMS uh, or a portfolio management service, you need to have at least 50 lakh rupees, right? So, you know, because there is a threshold. So, which means that you are taking away 99.9% .9 of the Indians. So, you know, so, I mean, even if PMS were to grow, it'll probably grow in just that 0.1%. More than 50 lakh rupees to allocate to equities, uh, so I don't think PMS in itself can really help the market grow. Uh, I mean, this the top one percent of India, anyways, is at risk. I mean, they're already you know, if you have money, I think already there are enough people taking care of your money, right, from your bank manager to everyone else. So, uh, I think I think longer term, I mean, the second bit of the question, which is you know, uh, I think um, the problem in India with mutual funds is that you know, there is no passive only mutual fund. Uh, and this is something that we are attempting as well, right? So, so we're going to be, you know, we're waiting on our SEPI licenses. Uh, you know, hopefully it comes through. If it does, I think we'll be the first, like a passive-only AMC in this country. Uh, you know, what passive-only gives you is, you know, it gives you like an operational leverage on your traditional AMCs because you don't have like these active fund managers, etc. So you can really, uh, you know, charge very little. And uh, and what has happened, I think, uh, over the last 10, 15 years is. The information asymmetry of sorts has kind of, you know, kind of, you know, kind of gone away, right? As in, so that's one of the reasons why index performs as well as active managers, or in, a lot of times beat them fund, fund managers. So I, I, I think there is an opportunity to be a passive only uh, AMC in this country um, and kind of help expand the markets um, by simplifying the product itself. Because today the problem is, you know, you go land on an AMC website or you know, like a fund house. There's a balance fund, there's hybrid fund, there is, you know, advantage fund. I mean, like, like why? You know, I, I don't even know why these funds are called whatever they're called. You know, and you know, how do they expect someone who's layman to, uh, to be to be able to even understand this? I think I think most of us, right? I mean, most people invest for for a rainy day, right, uh, or for their retirement, right? I mean, I mean, these are really two two causes. 
um, you know, and no one really cares it's hybrid or whatever, you know, so, uh, so can you really simplify the experience of buying that, which is you come, I mean, I retire in say 2050, you say I retire in 2050, I start allocating some funds and whatever the fund has to do, it does. Right? In 2050, it gives me back my money, right? I mean, which is what I think Vanguard did very well in US and which is why they've grown as much as they have. Um, but the problem with passive is that it's a very low margin business. Um, so the existing aim scenes in this country, you know, I mean, if you have an option to sell what makes you more versus what makes you less, you know, you'll always prefer what makes you more. So, you know, so there's always, there's been that conflict of sorts. So, so passives are never really kind of, the only people who buy passive products in India who are self-aware, you know, and it's a very small person, percentage of the population. So that's a very philosophical problem. How long will we take to become self-aware? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, I, th I think, you know, like we've been, we've spoken about this earlier, which is, you know, we need to introduce uh, finance in schools and colleges. Like, you know, I, I joke about this, which is, I don't know why I know circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. You know, I'm like, I like I've never ever used it in my life, you know, so, you know, and, uh, but uh, I, I think I should be knowing, you know, from school, like, you know, like how everyone probably here knows circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, probably everyone should know what's a passive fund, what is a, you know, what's a mutual fund, what is compounding, why... Or, or, or how is inflation going to kill you? Yeah, how inflation <laughs> is going to kill you, why you should invest, save for retirement. I think, I think these basic concepts have to be taught in school and, um, and, and hopefully, yeah, hopefully that change will happen in us. I think we should do something about it. I think uh, I've been working on a few things. Uh, we're announcing something soon where we have kind of taken that as a mission to get going. But it seems like a very scary problem. It's not like the mass India is suffering this. The affluent India is uh, also completely unaware of most of these concepts, and it's it's quite scary. Uh, uh, interest rates on your credit card uh, to what happens when you don't pay on time, and like all of these things are just alien concepts to the most affluent set. I don't know what is about money that people don't. I mean, people. Everyone wants money, but I don't know what is about managing money that people just don't care about it, you know, like, like, you know, if, if, to buy a kilo of tomato, you know, people will bargain for like hours, you know, I mean, but, you know, you'll go spend your life saving on an insurance plan without doing any research, I'm, you know, based on a tip, you know, I mean, I'm like, dude, like, I, I, I don't get that shit, though, I mean, like, you know, so, well, uh, you know, uh, so it's, I, it's, and I think <laughs> there is this belief we have that, you know, the, there is, there is, in our mythology, there's a belief that there's mantras that exist. Like, I say this mantra, and this happens, and I say this mantra. So I think the tips just manifest from that thing that there is one thing that I can do, and there is this belief in silver bullets that can just kind of make me rich. Yeah. No, I also, there is other, I, I would say there's another thing, right? In India, what has happened is financial products have been sold by distributors and not advisors. Okay, and, and what it means is, Say you walk into a bank, right? A bank is a distributor of financial products, you know. So he's going to sell you mutual funds, he's going to sell you insurance. And he's going to sell you what makes him the most money, right? I mean, it's a no-brainer. Now, so his incentive is no you not knowing that he's making as much money, right? So that means his incentive is, in a way, you remaining ignorant, right? So while, you know, the entire country has sold a lot of insurance policies, a lot of mutual funds, and a lot of financial products, no one has educated the customer in the process of the sale, why you are supposed to do it, or why you need to, you know, you need to understand. Whereas I think the thing about the US is it's more an advisory first, right? That means an advisor first explains you why this product is right for you, right? And and then you know, you 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 decide to do it or not. It's not. I'm not saying that you know US is a perfect model, but because it's an advisory f first, and there's a fiduciary kind of obligation on the advisor of having explained the product. I think U.S. has done a much better job in terms of financial literacy, you know, much better, you know, imagine like, you know, I walk into a bank, I, I'm a layman, and, and this bank manager tells me what exactly is the insurance policy I'm buying, and, and gives me, you know, like, compares it to 10 other policies and kind of explains why I'm doing this, right? I would be more knowledgeable, right? If I'm more knowledgeable, I'll go propagate this, right? And this is something... Uh, I've, I've, I've been talking, you know, publicly saying that, you know, we need to find ways to um, enable an advisory ecosystem in this country. You know, I mean, for a population 150 crores, we have 1,000 advisors in this country, you know. So, and, you know, so you need, you need like a, you know, like, uh, you know, there's something that we'll attempt in the next one, I, two, three I years. I kind of disagree with 
uh, what you are saying. We only have 1,000 licensed advisors. Because everybody is an advisor in India. Yeah, but the thing is that advisor is a distributor. So he's got an incentive in you not knowing it. Yeah, right. which, is, which is where it gets complicated. Uh, uh, also, there is this belief in India that we, we know for this I have to call this person, and for this I have to call this person. If I need something with my car, there is one guy. If there is money here, there is one guy. I think India has a very social way of looking at things. All of us know that this contact number is for what purpose and if I need to buy a good laptop, who to call? If I need to buy a, uh, a good car, who to call? And like there is this mindset that we live with. But I'm I'm gonna switch gears and ask you more like uh, uh, take a 10, 15 years view out of India. Uh, what are the things that you are most excited about, and what are the things that you are worried about? And take a 15 year view. Like yeah. we 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 have the luxury of seeing this crazy decade that we've all both of us have massively benefited from, but 15 years out. I mean, see, one of the reasons, you know, when, when someone says, why don't you exit, you know, some stake in the business and all, I say that, you know, I am, I'm 100% long India. And right? because it just, like in my head, you know, I, I might be proved wrong, but I, it somehow seems like, you know, like I think cyclically India, it's, it's, it's time for India, you know, and, and it's because of a bunch of things, which is firstly, I think, uh, yeah, I think I think like Elon Musk has said. I think this whole population crisis is a thing. You know, a lot of people think we are overpopulating, but I I'm, I'm I'm a firm believer that you know most countries in the world have a population crisis, uh, which means India is going to be one of the few countries where you know which has got the right demographics over the next 10, 20 years in terms of having the, the maximum population actually earning and generating you know revenue for the country and for the companies, etc. So, um, and usually when I, you know, meet my nephews and all of these kids, you know, who ask me for life advice, I say, do, do whatever, don't leave India. <laughs> so, you know, um, because this whole ambition of going to the U.S., doing, you know, whatever, you know, so I'm like, uh, yes, it's worked out in the past in the U.S., but I think U.S., uh, uh, given that dollar is kind of losing its supremacy, um, you know, maybe cyclically it's it's time for us to not do well over the next 30 40 years you know and and it's time for india to come um uh, so yeah so i think i'm excited about india now, the problem problem in india is that um will we make the journey from the $2000 per capita to $5000 per capita i mean i i don't know i don't know how we will get there i mean there's no pop, prob, you know, no point of having like this great population demographic if you know if, if the country is not becoming wealthier over time Right. Um, so, so I don't know. I don't know what new industries will come through in India because uh, you know, if you have such a large population, a working population, you also find need to find them jobs to do. You know. So, so, uh, but the fact that we have such a large working population, I uh, some of my gut says that you know the opportunities will present itself. Like you know, like for example, what's happening in China, and suddenly you know all these opportunities that are opening up in manufacturing. Right, um, so I think India has done a great job in terms of having cordial relationship with most countries in the world, right? Which means, you know, when opportunities open, you know, because one of the things that's also happening across the world is whole this deglobalization, right? I mean, I think countries are becoming more nationalized; they're thinking about themselves. Uh, so I think, I think, I don't know what it is today, but some, it's somehow like the gut says that over the next 10, 15, you know, next five, 10 years, you know, it, there'll be opportunities that'll open up for India, given how you know our relationships are with some of the large global countries you know in terms of uh, creating jobs and you know uh, of sorts so yeah w what am i excited most excited about is uh, is i mean i'm going to put you on spot uh -huh. what's going to be our gdp in 10 years from now i mean i, I mean that's a <laughs> that's a, it's really tough Ask you know so uh, I mean I I mean since this is conservative no I mean since everyone's estimating I mean I, don't, I mean this is a this is a political issue I don't want to <laughs> okay talk about one specific thing uh, uh, China had this one thing where before they took off on prosperity had ninety six percent of urban Chinese women that were actively working in the workforce right it's less than six seven percent in India what percent of your customers are male I mean see the thing is while a lot I mean while most of our customers are male, uh, I mean, even the tiny percent who are female, I think, are male. <laughs> those accounts in us. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. You know, I mean, <laughs> That's a good one. 
you know i mean the actual percentage of actually women managing their own accounts uh, is is really 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 small you know so or, or having their own income uh, uh, i mean that it's, it's tough for me to say it, but uh, but what we've done as an exercise is you know we've we've randomly picked up you know women customers and called them up and they're like oh you know speak to my husband you know so you know so and uh, um Uh, so yeah, no. I mean, I think absolutely that has to change. You know, I think I think women have to start. You know, a lot more. You know, Indian women have to start contributing. Uh, I mean, while it is happening, of course, in you know metros, but I think I think it's more at the rural level where you need women to be, you know, more kind of coming into the whole formal economy of sorts. You know, so uh, I mean, of course, for for the you know for India to do well, that has to happen. You know, it can't be just one. You know, like uh, uh, you know, women have to be kind of equal partners in this. love it love it uh i'm going to wrap with a maybe a just one last question uh and and i would love for you to spend some time with the team i'm sure they will want to maybe take a selfie with you i'm just <laughs> just kidding uh at least i have banned selfies at my uh, office for myself it's easier that way i'm sure you get recognized now and people ask you for tips or not does that happen I mean, I'm either in my in the office or at my home. I hardly ever get out. You know, so <laughs> that was my question. What What is your day like? Talk about that. I, I really am curious. Uh-huh. I I know for a fact that uh, I I still I recall this event multiple times, but I'll repeat it. Like I was meeting him once for a breakfast, and 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 he's texting me, "Hey, I'm just going to be 10-15 minutes late," and he's just I can see him. He's there in parking, and he's just and he's listening to his audio book. Like there's an important chapter that I was just finishing. I said, "Like, can you just wait?" and 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 I'm curious, like, how do you spend your time? Uh, and and has that changed over years? And I know health is a big focus for you, but like, how does your day look like? Yeah. Do you work? Uh, uh-huh. Do you work? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> so, uh, no, I mean, I've I've made uh, a lot of changes to my like you know my life over the last two two years. So I'm usually up by like 4:45 in the morning. Um, so I I work out between 5:30 to 7. um um i sit and play a little bit of guitar for like 20 30 minutes uh 7:30 7:45 you know around 8ish is when i start kind of figuring out what's happening in the world and see the news and all of that you know then 9 9:30 is when you know all this work activity starts um at, at work we have i mean i don't know if i should be talking about this but but yeah we we've, we've killed all work chats post 6 pm um so we were like you know it You need to call. You know, otherwise it's because most of our team is still working from home. You know, otherwise it kind of interferes too much. Uh, uh, you know, into the into personal life. So, um, so yeah. So I think by seven ish, I'm kind of done. You know, I'm kind of winding down for the day. And um, um, you know, in between, I listen to like on thirty forty minutes of like a podcast or you know like a book or something like that. So I have like this basketball thing in my house, like a hoop. so i'm usually shooting hoops and uh, and listening to something or i'm swimming and listening to something um and um, and yeah and then i have you know my son's 7 years old so the last 45 minutes of the day you know one hour is with him so it's usually you know like i think one of the one of the big challenge statements you know i, I have no solution about you know i don't know how i'm going to solve for it is you know how do i you know help him get you know like you know figure stuff out you know so <laughs> like and and without really trying to push across my choices on him like you know like he plays the drums and you know sometimes I'll be like dude pink floyd I'm like no post malone <laughs> you know so like, so it's you know uh, like I'm I'm uh, uh I'm trying to uh, yeah I think I think it's it's a it's a, like right now my most interesting project in my life is really you know is my son you know so just just to uh, you know just the fact that the way his curiosity is is going up uh, every day and and how do i make sure he doesn't get consumed by technology and and all of those problem statements of sorts so, so do you have rules for him not really you know i mean uh, uh, i mean i don't let him eat junk you know i mean so i um, um what else uh, in rules yeah i mean i think that's about it you know in terms of, and, and yeah this whole ipad i mean do in today's you know if you if you give kids like you know this is a joke okay like my mom keeps asking, you know telling uh, you know everyone that um you know nikhil my younger brother is 7 years younger to me and and she keeps telling everyone oh, you know nikhil exists only because of nitin because nitin you know said i need a brother i need a brother he kept crying and then it is 
then i was like oh there was no iphone back then <laughs> if you had given me a phone i would probably not have asked for a phone who knew nikhil is iphone <laughs> yeah so uh, so yes i mean of course you know i've i've you know there's a limited amount of uh, time access to you know this, this internet for him i mean apart from those two rules i mean there isn't really much in his home okay thank you so much dude thank you so much for doing this guys uh, nitin and and big round of applause for him thank you so much boss this is always good uh, nitin i i learn so much every time i spend time with you uh, uh, hopefully i'll keep learning from you uh, uh, i i just wish uh, uh, i can take a lot of the lessons that you have and apply it uh, i i'll be i'll confess that we have the curse of capital uh, and i i keep talking about it in every all hands with the team more people does not do more things uh, capital is a unique curse that we have and and uh, uh, and because i've also run businesses uh, for a decade where there was no money uh, sorry no external funding and i i did not understand what that meant like you have to just make money profit and just reinvest uh, i i wish i can take a lot of these lessons and and keep building a very very enduring company so thank you so much man no no, no thanks and uh, just a back story you know like when kunal was starting cred you know and he said you know like he's going he's raising you know this much money at this valuation and he's still kind of crystallizing on idea i'm like dude i want to be on that <laughs> in that party you know i don't know what that idea is you know so, <laughs> you know if people are giving you that much money for you know when you're crystallizing an idea it must be something really sharp and the, the other thing was you know i think one of these rounds you know uh, you know i think uh, uh, i forgot who sends uh, akshay akshay uh, akshay permit akshay um, uh, yeah yeah right yeah, so they, they send an email saying oh there is like a secondary available and etc and and i mean we have never sold any stake in any private business okay but then you know it was so sweetly written like you know there is secondary available and etc and at around the same time uh, there was uh, another you know like a non profit profit in you know, a borderline on you know, this organic mandia they called you know uh, you know they helping farmers go organic etc you know so they had sent a email saying you know they needed some money and and then i was like oh maybe it's time to you know kind of marry these two you know like opportunities and you know <laughs> take money from here and give it to them but then i regretted because you know then i like in 3 months he said you know dude you are raising money and more money <laughs> 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 <It was, laughs> i'm like damn you know like then then the last time uh, uh you know uh, last two three rounds you know like when kunal sent you know i mean akshay sent an email my my response has been yolo <laughs> <laughs> you know like you know so not exiting anything you know so <laughs> Uh, so no thanks thanks for having me kunal and uh, and best of luck uh, to everyone here uh, uh, on in building cred you know I'm, i i think I, i don't think there's any brand in india who's you know who's been able to so quickly gather mind share of so many people you know so so congrats on that you know i'm 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 sure you know eventually it'll lead to a lot of revenues and profits as well you know thank thank you so much and and the lesson of life is uh, money is root of all evil <laughs> absolutely <laughs>